أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وانت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن اذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم اعذنا من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا واصلح لنا شاننا كله لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين آمين آمين أما بعد My dear beloved respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته May the peace and blessings of God Almighty be with each and every one of you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, reveals in the Qur'an about our relationship with others in society, our relationship with uh, people of other faith, with non-Muslims, our responsibility of engaging in da'wah, of inviting others to God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ahla al-kitabi ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum. An address to the people of the book. And this is an expression that refers to the Christians and the Jews, those who believe in one God. Kul ya ahla al-kitabi Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum. O people of the book, let us come together on common terms, on a basis of agreement, things we agree upon, that we should worship none but God Almighty, and that we should take no one and nothing as partners besides God Almighty, meaning we should not commit shirk, we should not worship other than God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it establishes a basis of commonality that we have with the Ahlul Kitab, for example. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also reveals in the Quran, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawaidati al hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan. Call to the way of your Lord. Invite to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty. Bil hikmati wal mawaidati al hasanati. With wisdom and with the best of preaching, the best of ways, with good preaching. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions in the hadith Al hikmatu dalatul mu'min. That wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Like if you have something and you lose it, you want to search for it, you want to get it. To find ways to retrieve it, to get it back again. So similarly, wisdom, our relationship to wisdom, the relationship with the Muslim, the believer to wisdom, that it's our lost property, it belongs to us. Therefore, go after it, find it, achieve it, attain it, use it. 
in what you do in your life. And the Prophet ﷺ says again, anni walaw aya. Convey from me this message of Islam, even if it is one verse. And so this, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the Quran, and what the Prophet ﷺ mentions in his hadith, it points us out, it gives us directives for the way that we should thread upon with respect to inviting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our relationship with people of other faith, especially those who claim monotheism, that they worship one God. We continue in this lecture to share our reflections on the views of King Charles III on Islam and Muslims, what he has said in the past, uh, when he was Prince Charles. Uh, and this is as a result of the incidents that have taken place recently, the passing of Queen Elizabeth II on Thursday, September 8, 2022, at the age of 96 years. She served as a monarch, the leader of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth for more than 70 years. And she served her people with grace and poise and dignity, faith and purpose. They loved her and there was that outpouring of love at her passing. And then on the same day, Thursday, September 8, 2022, Prince Charles, Prince of Wales, he became the new leader of Britain and the Commonwealth became King Charles III. And because of what he has said in the past, his positive comments and views about Islam and Muslims, we want to share with you some reflections on this. Uh, that he, being such an important person in the world, saying positive things about Islam uh, must be credited. And it's for us as Muslims to promote these views and magnify these views to others, share the, the, the positive things that King Charles has said about Islam with others, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Prince Charles was someone, and now King Charles, who went out of his way to make positive remarks about Islam and Muslims. He mentioned in the past his appreciation, his admiration, his likeness for Islamic gardens and the design of Islamic gardens, Islamic art and calligraphy, Islamic te textiles and other aspects of the manifestation of Islamic civilization. He has mentioned that uh, on, on many occasions in the past, his appreciation for this Islamic architecture. Many years ago, he visited Cambridge University and he said he wanted to talk about Islam. He could have chosen any other topic to speak about at Cambridge University. But when he was asked, he said that's what he was, that was, that's what interests him. He wanted to share reflections about the Quran. And on many, in many of these engagements, he, he would strive to overcome the prevailing binary and opposite perception and approach of people, striving to bring people together. This binary outlook of East versus West, of Islam versus non-Islam, of black versus white, of immigrant versus non-immigrant and so on. Much of the public debate uh, at all levels or many levels were based on that binary perception of opposites. And so he wanted to move beyond that and to strive to bring people together. And he should be given credit for doing so, for thinking outside the box, for sometimes causing controversy in his remarks as well. About one example of 
his relationship with Islam and Muslims and his deep concern. About 10 years ago, the Daily Mail, a popular newspaper in the United Kingdom, got angry when they found out that Prince Charles was learning Arabic. And they published that in their newspaper uh, in this alarming manner that Prince Charles, the heir to the crown, is learning Arabic. And why did he want to learn Arabic? He was asking, he said, because he wanted to understand the Quran. That's why he was learning Arabic, because he wanted to understand the Quran, to, to have a deeper level of understanding of the Quran. And, and you can very well ask yourself, why would he do that? He has nothing to gain materially for taking time out from his busy schedule to study Arabic only so that he can understand the Quran at a deeper level. How many people do that? How many member parliaments, political leaders, other community leaders, important people in society, how many of them would do that? I mean, even Muslims, how many Muslims would take the time and make a sacrifice to learn Arabic, the language of the Quran, the language of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, the language of the inhabitants of paradise. Not many people do that. But he had this uh, deep connection that he wanted to understand is, uh, the Quran at his very source, not to be satisfied with using a translation of the Quran, but to study it so he can know that. And, and it's, a, it's an important lesson for us as Muslims to have this commitment to studying the Quran and wanting to learn the Quran more so that you can get closer to God Almighty, closer to the Prophet ﷺ, understand Islam more so you can live it and practice it more. This, is, this should be your near your intention. And be willing to make that sacrifice to study the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ described the best of believers, the best of Muslims. And he said in that hadith, which is narrated by Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ The best of you is the one who studies this Quran and then teaches it to others. This is the great honor of studying the Quran and then teaching it to others. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, said, the best of believers, the best of Muslims is the one who does that, study the Quran and teaches it to others. This is something that we should commit ourselves to doing, to understanding and studying this Quran more and more. So th 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 these are some of the things that King Charles did that we wanted to share with you that we can learn important lessons from. In, in the previous part of this series of lectures, we share reflections on a critically important speech he gave many years ago at Oxford University, at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. And he mentioned many wonderful things in, in that speech. We, we shared some reflections on it in the previous uh, lectures in this series. Uh, and among the things he said is that Islam is all around us. The title of his speech was Islam and the West. And so he's addressing that audience in the West in this part of the speech saying that Islam is all around us. And saying that as far as the West is concerned, they have no excuse for being ignorant of Islam because Islam is all around us. He said at, at that time, he said there are one billion Muslims worldwide. At that time, uh, now, today, it's much more than that. It's uh, close to 2 billion Muslims in the world today. And, and many other research 
surveys and research organizations have said that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world today. And close to 2 billion human beings are Muslims. He said as well, many millions of them live in countries of the commonwealth. So that is of immediate concern to him because as King Charles, uh, he is the leader of the commonwealth group of countries. And before when he gave the speech, and he was Prince Charles, Prince of Wales then, he was the heir to the crown. His mother, Queen Elizabeth, was the leader. So it's of immediate concern to them, the, the commonwealth group of countries, because they're the head of state. For example, for Canada, the, uh, King Charles is the head of state of, of Canada. Before him, his mother, Queen Elizabeth, was the head of state. And such is the case, case in the, the, the Commonwealth group of countries. So he says many millions of them, and there are actually hundreds of millions of them living in, in the Commonwealth countries or former Commonwealth countries. In the subcontinent, for example, hundreds of millions of Muslims living there and in many other places. He said 10 million or more live in the West. Once again, now it's much more than that. In America alone, there are more than 10 million Muslims. In, in United Kingdom, there are a huge number of Muslims. In Canada, in many other countries as well. And he says around 1 million live in Britain. Now it's much more than that. In, in the city of Birmingham alone, there are close to 1 million Muslims. Uh, the largest contingent of Muslims in any city in the UK and in the West, Birmingham. Uh, so he's saying that Islam is all around us. Says our own Islamic community in the United Kingdom has, has been growing and flourishing for decades. And uh, the, the presence of Muslims in the United Kingdom and in other places has affected and influenced the culture of the people, of everyone. And so things, food, for example, different food items that were strange things several decades ago are now household items in, across the UK, not only in, in Muslim homes, but uh, throughout the, the country and in the West as well. He continued in this speech to talk about the potential for conflict, what has happened in the past, what is happening now, and what we should do. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we must not slide into a new era of danger and division because governments and peoples, communities and religions cannot live together in peace in a shrinking world. That we need to be mindful about the potential for conflict. He said it is odd in many ways that misunderstandings between Islam and the West should persist. It says, for that which binds our two worlds together is so much more powerful than that which divides us. Important point, we mentioned the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, Kul ya ahl al-kitab. So the Prophet Ali sallam, is commanded to say to the people of the book, and by extension, the believers are commanded to say to the people of the book, Jews and Christians, Kul ya ahl al-kitabi, ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum. Let us come together on common terms, on things that we agree upon. Let's focus on that. And so he's saying here, for that which binds our two worlds together is so much more powerful than that which divides us. So don't focus on the things that divide us, the things we dif differ over. Focus on the things that we agree upon. Common terms as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. Kalimatin sawa, a beautiful and powerful concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the Quran. He said uh, you know, the, the three main religion, monotheistic religion, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, have much to share in common. He says, Islam and Christianity share a common monotheistic vision, a belief in one divine God. 
in the transience of our earthly life. So believe in God Almighty. We share that belief. Then in the temporary nature of this earth, this earthly life, the, the, the life in this dunya is temporary. So Islam teaches us, Christianity te teaches that as well. He is identifying the common terms, common things we agree upon. To establish this fact that we have much in common. Therefore, work together. Let's work together on things we have in common. So the, the temporary nature of earthly life. In our accountability for our actions. And so we believe in the day of judgment. That we have to give ultimate accountability to our actions. We are also accountable in this world. But even if someone may escape accountability in this world, they must be held accountable and will be held accountable on the, day, on the day of judgment by God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So accountability for actions and in the assurance of life to come, the life hereafter. Yes, it's amazing that he's mentioning this because uh, many uh, non-Muslims today, they don't have this, this attachment to the hereafter, to the life of the hereafter. They live as if all of existence is this dunya, this world only. So they do whatever they want to do. But he's mentioned the belief system of Christianity. They, they do believe in that. And uh, pious uh, practicing Christians believe in that. He says we share many key values in common. In terms of values that we share in common are respect for knowledge. And the Prophet ﷺ elevated this pursuit of knowledge to be one of the most virtuous acts of worship, acts of ibadah of God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And tells us that this pursuit of knowledge leads you to Jannah, show you the pathway to Jannah. Much are the great benefits of knowledge and the seeking of knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge in Islam. So he's mentioning we share that value in common. They have respect for knowledge, we do. Respect for justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that important value of justice in society that we must all uphold and live by. Compassion towards the poor and underprivileged. This is the very essence of our zakat system, our sadaqat system, or khayrat lillahi that we have in our, in our religion of Islam. Care for others, concern for others, always willing to share with others. He said, these are things we hold in common. The importance of family life. This is a very important point. He says, we share this in common. Importance of family life. And this traditional understanding of family that is being eroded now in much of Western culture and Western society that we should always strive to revive and let people know this. As Muslims, we must be the exemplars of this, of successful family life. A husband and a wife, a man and a woman, and their children, and their grandchildren, and their parents and grandparents. That we should promote the, the institution of the family because it's so great uh, in Islam. And this is the, the unit, the building block of society, not the individual, but the family. So it's important that he, he would talk about family life as well. And he says, among the values we share in common, Respect for parents, that we should have that respect for parents. He says, honor thy father and thy mother is a Quranic precept and concept. And then he concludes there, he says, our history has been closely bunged up together. He mentioning commonalities, common terms, things that we share, values that we share, and so on. There, however, 
is one root of the problem that we have of this division and potential for conflict. For much of that history has been one of conflict. 14th century is too often, too often marked by mutual hostility. There has given rise to, and this has given rise to an enduring tradition of fear and distrust. Because there are two worlds have so often seen that past in contradictory ways, in different ways. To Western school children, he's giving this example now, what happens in the schools. To Western school children, the 200 years of crusades are traditionally seen as a series of heroic, chivalrous exploits in which the kings, knights, prince, princes, and children of Europe try to wrest Jerusalem from the wicked Muslim infidel. infidel. To Muslims now, the crusades or an episode of great cruelty and terrible plunder of, of Western individuals, infidel soldiers of fortune and horrific atrocities. Perhaps exemplified best by the massacres committed by the Crusaders when in 1099 they took back Jerusalem, the third holiest city in Islam. And, and the Crusaders uh, pillaged much of uh, the Muslim lands and committed tremendous atrocities. History records that. He continues, for us in the West, 1492 speaks of human endeavor and a new and new horizons of Columbus and the discovery of the Americas. So this is one of the things that is teach you in, in Western history. Columbus discovered America, discovered the new world in 1492. Well, the response of Muslims to that is that there were already people living here, the indigenous people, the native people, the Indian people. They had an advanced civilization, the Aztec Empire, the Inca Empire, and so on, in many places. And they, they lived for thousands of years. How can European people come and discover America? You know, but this is the Eurocentric history that they're taught in schools. So he's comparing it. He says to Muslims, 1492 is a year of tragedy. The year Granada, Granada fell to Ferdinand and Isabella, king and queen in Spain, signified the end of eight centuries of Muslim civilization in, in Europe. And there in, in Spain, uh, yeah, Muslims were rulers of that country, that civilization, and they brought much development, much uh, advancement to society. This is one of the things that the Muslims did wherever they went. They made that society better. And Muslim scientists and inventors, engineers and mathematicians and scholars invented many things that benefited society. Many years ago, National Geographic uh, sponsored an exhibition, Sultans of Science. Uh, it was shown in many places in the world, including here in Toronto, the Toronto Science Center. They had a special uh, season for that exhibition. And they, they mentioned there in that exhibition of the contribution of Muslims to civilization. Throughout the centuries that we, uh, the Muslim the Islamic civilization was a ruling civilization in the world, made countless numbers of inventions that people benefited from. Because this was uh, the conviction of that Muslim scientist. They wanted to use the knowledge that God Almighty had given to them to benefit others. And so they focus on that to invent instruments that would benefit society and not instruments that would harm people and kill people and weapons of war and so on. And there's a difference. So uh, Muslims ruled uh, Spain at one point in time, established many great universities in Alhambra, Cordoba and so on. And I remember once on one of my visits to Spain, I visited, I was in the city of Granada. 
I was walking with uh, the guy, uh, one of my Muslim colleagues, who was taking me around. And I was dressed in my Islamic garb, my gang and turban and so on. And there, there are a couple of elderly people, a man and, uh, his, and his wife. Uh, they, they passed by and they stopped and they, they started to talk with us. And he mentioned in that conversation, he says, at one time you were ruling us. He mentioned that, a recognition of uh, the Muslims and the role they played in, in Spain and brought much uh, civilizing influence to that society. King Charles continued in his speech, he said, the point I think is not that one or the other picture is more true or has a monopoly and truth. It is that misunderstandings arise arise when we fail to appreciate how others look at the world, its history, and our respective roles in it. The corollary of how we in the West see our history has so often been to regard Islam as a threat in medieval times, as a military conqueror, and in more modern times as a source of intolerance, extremism, and terrorism. So this is how the West view Muslims in Islam. One can understand how the taking of Constantinople when it fell to Sultan Mahmud in 1453 and the close run defeats of the Turks outside of Vienna in 1529 and 1683 should have sent shivers of fear through the rulers of Europe. But the threat has not been one way. Now he's talking now about what Europe did. He says, with Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798, followed by the invasions and conquests of the, of the 19th century, the pendulum swung, and almost all the Arab world became occupied by the Western powers. He's referring now to the era of colonialism. With the fall of the Ottoman Empire, Europe's triumph over Islam seemed complete. Those days of conquest are over. But even now, our common attitude to Islam suffers because the way we understand it has been hijacked by the extreme and the superficial. To many of us in the West, Islam is seen in terms of the tragic civil war in Lebanon, the killings and bombings perpetuated by extremist groups in the Middle East, and by, by what is commonly referred to as Islamic fundamentalism. Our judgment of Islam has been grossly mis distorted by taking the extremes to be the norm by taking the extremes to be the norm, and which is not. And it's good that he can recognize that. There's a small minority of extremists, but in much of the Western world and in the media and so on, they, they portray that as, as, if, as if that is representative of Islam, by taking the extremes to be the norm. That, he says, ladies and gentlemen, is a serious mistake. It is like judging the quality of life in Britain by the existence of murder and rape, child abuse, and drug addiction. The extremes exist, and they must be dealt with. But when used as a basis to judge a society, they lead to distortion and unfairness. And an example of this, he says, people in this country frequently argue that a Sharia law, the Islamic law of the Islamic world is cruel, barbaric, and unjust. Our newspapers, the media above all, love to peddle those unthinking prejudices about Islam and Muslims. The truth is, of course, different and always more complex. Yes. So these are a few things I wanted to share with you, some reflections on, of what King Charles has said about Islam and Muslims. Uh, much positive things, his views. Uh, which we need to understand, which we should promote to others. Let other Muslims know about this. Let especially non-Muslim colleagues, co-workers, neighbors, and so on, know about what King Charles has said about Islam and Muslims, the positive views he, he has. And this would help to, in some little way, help people to understand Islam more. And hopefully they can get closer to Islam 
closer to the Quran, study the Quran and understand the Quran. They can get closer to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Study him, the Prophet, his great personality, the greatest of personalities that ever walked on the face of this earth. People need to know about him and it's our duty to convey that message. Remember this responsibility you have of da'wah, of inviting others to God Almighty, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawidati al hasana. He has called to the way of your Lord with goodness, with good preaching, with hikmah and wisdom. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala bless us to do that and to be counted from among the best of believers. Amin, amin, amin. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. La ilaha illallah